subject of your verb, uh, of your sentence, it or this. Are the notes on the right hand before? You'll be taking the, uh, uh, so I, I think you're asking me quite simply, what's today's lesson topic? We are doing L7, cause, uh, sorry, Archaic China, Origins 2, and Ashan. L7, sorry, I didn't write that there. The date is what, the 28th? 29. Now please introduce yourself to the, the three people in your group so that you know your names. This is very important. Okay, having introduced yourselves. Sorry. This is how I decide the random groupings. So this randomizer, it's not me, it's God, right? I just paste the roster in there and I hit randomize and it gives me a random list. And so that's fate working. All right. Um, I should ask Cattlebone, but okay. Does everybody look over the rubric? It's very simple, right? Just heading for each main idea transition and then indentation showing. I'm indenting once from the margin. That's the first main idea. I indent again. That idea applies to whatever the more lefter indentation level. Do I have to try to articulate this or do you understand how indentations work? Thank you. All right. That's really, really a, a brain work. Now, in your groups, I want you, in your threesomes, to simply place the Hebrews, the Chinese, and the Greeks on this continuum. Before you do it, though, let me get my lecture notes, or my, my notes, where are they? Here they are. And give you a couple of concepts that are very important, just straight out of the box. When you do comparative history, these things need to be clearly, clearly, clearly understood. I'm not showing you this page. So that, first let's talk about some, you don't have to write them down if you know them, I am just underscoring their importance and relevance to a comparative history, particularly, and here's where it gets interesting, when one of the histories and cultures that you're comparing is your own. Notice how when we talk about world religions, we are so comfortable talking about how weird the other ones are, I just think that's so wrong that blah, blah, blah. But as soon as some people hear their own religion talked about equally critically, they go, don't say that about my religion. I am offended, right? We're doing comparative history. We should not ever be insulting anything. But there's a difference between saying that sucks and there's a problem with this particular aspect. And I'm going to describe it and make a claim that it might have some undesirable effects, right? Okay, does anybody have any challenges, questions, clarifications that they need on the, the, the difference between describing and evaluating, first of all, because right now we're gonna start out by describing. And the reason I'm front-loading it with this conceptual clarification is that experience has taught me that if you don't point out the simple difference between describing and evaluating, some people hear description as evaluation and they get offended, okay? In a comparative histories course, if you cannot, when you go to college, they are going to expect you to be able to have rational conversations about things that adults have learned to not be sensitive about, right? And so, um, I will repeat, respect, always. Critical thinking, always, right? Jesus himself criticized his religion. He was, after all, a Hebrew. Judaism, he was not a Christian. Jesus, there was no such thing as Christianity when Jesus lived. He was a Hebrew. He was an Old Testament Hebrew, and he went to church, and he upended tables and raised utter hell and got arrested for causing a riot at church. 
He pointed his finger at the, at the Pharisees and the priests, and he told them that they were hypocrites. He mentioned all sorts of laws that he disagreed with in his own faith. Martin Luther took a nail to the wall of the, of the church in his hometown, and he was a priest. And he criticized the Pope and his religious institution because he believed in his religion, and not sheepishly, but critically. There are problems with my religion. They need fixing. And notice his fix stuck <laughs> for 500 years now, at least with half the church. If it was a fix, I just got evaluated. It would be simple to say that Martin Luther was right, because there are a lot of things that the Catholic Church provides the, the Christian faith that have value that the Protestants lost. So notice, we're now talking the trait-based stuff that we were talking earlier when we were saying, can you do apples and oranges? Can you do civilizations and say one's better than the other? Now I'm starting to sound like many of you. You can only say certain specific aspects. But in any case, second, opinion versus argument. An opinion, what's the difference? Uh, colorful language alert. In the army, we have a uh, saying, probably my favorite part of the army, besides waking up and being outside exercising at 5.30 every mo morning, Monday through Friday, is the colorful language. So colorful language alert. It's an army idiom. It's an army saying. Opinions are like a-holes. Okay, I, I, I just sort of softened it for you. Everybody has one. An argument is not an opinion. What separates it? What separates an argument from an opinion? You're like thinking about it and putting rational sense. You're using reason and evidence. You're re using reason and evidence. I don't care what you think until you tell me why you think it. Because of this, which shows this. If you just say, I think all penguins are evil. Well, you know what? That's, a, that's an opinion that right now sounds stupid to me. I need some evidence. You talk about a, a, you know, a preponderance of penguins committing mass murder and serial killing and rape and you know, <laughs> theft and all sort of thing. Then you've got some evidence. Show me some statistics. But right now, that's just a stupid opinion. No, not. it's just an opinion. It might be right. Argue. OK, so I've got to find a colorful way to, to, to just like in one symbol mark opinion in writings where you're just blathering opinions. What, what sort of shorthand can I use that will be fun? Extend, challenge, and qualify. Have we gone over this language? Please give me a, a east, west, or a north, south. Extending as in simple words. Okay, this is AP, AP Lang. When I taught AP Lang, this is the, the language that AP Lang encouraged us to use in teaching critical thinking. So this is a skill. You might actually put it in your skill thing. Um, because this is a discussion skill. How do I like actually make an intelligent response to somebody else's claim? By extending it. You know what? You're right. And there's even more. You just made me realize there's more evidence for what you said. By qualifying it. Half of what you said I agree with, but half of what you said, part of what you said I agree with, part of what you said I don't agree with. I want to qualify your claim. Right? I want to qualify what you just argued. You were right about this, but I think you were off about this. Challenge. Straight out. I don't agree. All right? I'm going to challenge your claim. Don't even bother if it's opinion. Just go, um, can you give us an, ar an argument instead of a, an opinion if we ever have, you know, uh, when we have discussions? Spectrum thinking. So today what we're going to do conceptually is we're going to start with a spectrum thinking exercise where we don't say something is or is not. We say on this spectrum, where does it sit on a continuum? Second, we're going to continue essentializing cultures, which is what we did with the Ming and the Portuguese and Spanish. What essential, as in like genetic DNA type stuff culturally, might we infer from what we have seen? What sort of essential traits do we see? It's a dangerous exercise, but it's not a useless one. As many of you said again, when you judge cultures, you have to be careful but it's silly to say you can't say that one culture has certain essential characteristics that another culture that differentiate it from another culture. It's, it's, to me, a silly claim to say that they don't have essential differences. And so we're essentializing. Finally, change in continuity. We're going back to the seeds. Let's use that metaphor. The seeds of China, Israel, and the Greeks. Those are our three archaic civilizations for this unit. And so if you picture them as seeds in the ground, 
Well, picture them now 3,000 years later. Massive, massive, massive oak trees. What are those bigger trees than oak trees? What are those bigger trees than oak trees? Redwoods. Redwoods, thank you. Uh, all right? They start from a small seed and they grow over time and, and, and such. And so the archaic period is interesting because it's the seeds. So certain things that we talk about today when we essentialize based on the stories that you read will have changed over time because we are now 3,000 years later. Certain aspects essential in the outlooks of those three cosmological narratives will no longer be particularly noticeable in the three cultures. But the interesting thing, and this is why history is just delicious, a lot of them do continue from then and out. So that's what time is. That's what history is. Origins to present, what changes and what stays the same. This is all boring textbook stuff until you actually like start going, you know what, but if you give me something good to read, it's a really interesting thing to do. So I gave you something good to read, that's why it's still around 3,000 years later. I want you to, with your partners, don't let me forget to, at the end of this class, I'll go ahead and, and give you an overview of the class. So we're going to do just the Shang dynasty today, China's origins and Shang. I'm going to preview and model, as I go, how certain factual things can actually be very interesting on second glance. When you look at them a second time, they can be very interesting. At the end, I'm going to say, you have just seen me like actually go boring fact at first glance, but on second thought, almost first, really interesting. Now, at the end of the course, I'm going to say, which one of these really interesting possibilities, ways of looking at what seem at first glance boring facts most appeal to you and you must answer one of them because you have no if you say nothing interested me today then just quit you know just buy leave go go take another class that you do enjoy because we're talking about the beginning of China we're talking about the seeds of China there will be many 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 interesting angles of, of vision on these things notice what I'm leaving open we haven't done the Hebrews and we haven't done the Greeks. And so I'm, I'm doing this to show you that there are certain angles that you're like, you know what, what you just did with the Chinese, I would like to explore the Greek and the Hebrew and see the effects of that particular aspect of early Chinese seed civilization and compare it to the different but equivalent parallels in Judeo-Christianity and the Greek, Trojan, Mycenaean, and, and uh, classical Greeks, because that's the two roots of, Greek, of Western culture. This book is really, it's not, it's not on my desk anymore where it was the whole time so I could show it to you until I moved it over here. By the way, I moved this, thank you, whoever left it right here hanging, so you would see it and go, hey, that's mine, I left my dirty laundry on your, on your table, in your room, it's not anybody's? Okay, so good, I've got that one out of the way. This man is um, Chinese, Li Feng, he is at Columbia University, I think, possibly NYU. This, is, this was just published last year. Now, I'm making it available to you because notice its title, Early China. And particularly notice, if you think that history and historians are always about politics and wars, I hope you don't. I find those the most boring aspects. Not, not boring, but the most boring. Notice his subtitle, A Social and Cultural History. So this is social and cultural, right? This man is an archaeologist, a reader of classical Chinese, and an expert in ancient Chinese history, who has actually dug and analyzed and done archaeological work on what has been dug up from the Shang Dynasty, right? So this text, are you okay, Dimple? So, okay, so this text is here, and it's also, um, I've got a link to it in a file pattern on Moodle, where I hope you will actually say, you know, I've never actually read scholarship before. I've only read textbooks. What's the difference? Because college is going to be asking you to read scholarship. And so, uh, he's fantastic. Did I put the spectrum up yet? Can you, uh, Lauren, can you please turn on that fan? It's warm in here. Okay. There are 
quite a spectrum right there. So here's your, there's your, there's your, 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 your continuums. Cosmology. When you think of the text that you read, and by the way, apologies. Apologies for the length. Until I have more hours a week to plan, because World Studies Night is not taking my every A3 period away from me to sit with six other teachers and debate the wording of rubrics every A day. I'm supposed to have three periods to plan. I have two because of that. And so I'm sorry. I'm, I'm often running to class going, I wish I had ten more minutes to go. Is that too long? So if it felt too long? I realize it. Uh, Zach Long, I was like, Zach, tell me. You know, always tell me any sort of negative uh, things that you feel like I should hear. He was like, I'll tell you one right now. I was like, what? He was like, the homework felt too long. I was like, I know I was afraid of that, right? And so I'm conscious of that. My goal is to make your homework 45 minutes, typically. All right. So anyway. Here's, your, here's your, your spectrum, thus the cosmologies and apologies. Cosmology, the universe and how it got here. On your, on your continuum, decide where the Hebrews, where the Greeks, and where the, the, the Chinese stand. It's a very natural cosmology, how the universe got here and all that, or it's a very supernatural one. Place them. The same with the outlook. I walk through the world, Chinese, Greek, or Hebrew. I am optimistic. It's like I walk around and, and life is pretty good, or I'm pessimistic. I walk around and it's like life is not very, you know, life is bright or life is dark. Okay? Situate them. Thinking. The explanations that we have for things are rational versus the explanations that we have for things are non-rational. Okay? There are more than one ways of thinking and explaining. That's the, that's the continuum. We could use all sorts of words here, but notice I just used a neutral one. Right? Finally, human nature. Innocent, guilty. Greeks, Chinese. You've got four minutes to discuss amongst your threes. And uh, if you think that there are any other categories that you want to add, any other spectrums that you notice that's not included in this one, feel free to add that. I'm done. I'll give you five minutes to discuss. Sir, so. Oh, evidence. We want evidence. So, because. Go ahead. Uh, do you want us to write this down in our notebooks or just leave it? He didn't pick me to represent. All right. So, Arjun, in cosmology, what was your spectrum from natural to supernatural? Uh, the most natural would probably have to be the Judaic, um, the Genesis book, because even though God admittedly did create um, the world out of nothing, he did that. He started using materials from the world he created to make everything else. Okay, so we've got one Hebrew, and we'll put this... I don't know how to make this work in a table. I suppose I'll just insert it. Alright. The rest of you... Hmm. Life is just too short, and so are classes. This is such a... This would be a great, like, hour-long conversation. Uh, how do I... How do I... What do I want to do there? I want to do a row above, row above, row above, row above. Stop it. Here, I want to do a row above. Okay, so we have one Hebrew as the most natural cosmology, and then which is the least natural cosmology? The Chinese, because they have a dragon coming out of an egg to feed the world. Okay, and so you're putting the Greeks in the middle. All right. Um, tell me about your outlook, optimistic to pessimistic. Um, and, and quickly. Okay, well, the Greeks are the most pessimistic because, well, the Greek tragedies. No, stop. You did readings. Don't tell me about your Greek tragedies. We are talking about cosmological stuff. Don't go off topic with stuff that you think you know from other things. We are trying to have a conversation about shared understandings. So, I ask you the question again. Based on the evidence from the readings, which was the most pessimistic, which was the most optimistic? The Jews. Mm -hmm. They're the most I'm putting H for Hebrews. All right. Which was the most optimistic? Chinese. And you're putting the Greeks in the middle again? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and... Thinking, rational to non-rational. Um, Quickly. Yeah. Uh, the 
Greeks were probably the most rational. Um, the most non-rational were the Christian or Hebrews. 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 All right. So you're putting the Chinese in the middle. All right. And finally, uh, innocent, guilty. Um, Hebrews definitely thought the Hebrews were most guilty, and uh, and the Greeks thought that the humans were uh, in the middle. So who's Chinese? Okay. Can we try to <laughs> thank you? Can we try to answer these like just really quickly? We'll discuss our disagreements in a minute. I just want to I just want to plug these things. So even without the reasons, <laughs> bloody time, I hate you. All right, Chris. Um, okay, supernatural. They're all in the crazy set of supernatural. Um, outlook. Uh, really? You, you could not you could not critically think you're going to be a week. I'm sitting the fence here. Uh, I can't like make an argument. You guys are that lame that you're like we're just going to sit the fence. That's so wishy-washy. Don't do that in any course because it's showing that you can't like actually say, although it's hard to decide, I can actually still say one can be more than another. Because what can we do with that? Remind me to kill all of you later. All right, what else? All right, so in cosmology, they're all su equally supernatural. Okay, thanks. Next. Um, then we have the same um, for the outlook, which was Chinese, which is the most optimistic. And the Hebrews were the most the, the most pessimistic. So CGH. Yep, thank you. Um and then the thinking. Um the most rational were the Greeks, the least rational were the Hebrews, so it's the same thing as well. Um and then human nature, the most guilty was the Hebrew, innocent Chinese, and neutral Greek. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, Sydney. Uh, for cosmology, we had the Chinese... Speak up, Sydney. Okay, sorry. Uh, we had that the Chinese were the... Uh, or had the most natural outlook on cosmology. Okay, finally, controversy. Which was the most supernatural? Uh, the Greeks. The Greeks? Yeah. All right, and so you've got the Hebrews and the Nogan. All right. Um, optimistic, pessimistic? Uh, Greek was the most optimistic and Hebrews were most pessimistic. Okay, and so we got one Chinese in there, all right. And those uh, of you who took HOC realize, see, we're, we're throwing the, the Greeks in here now, so it's not the same uh, opening. <laughs> no, where were we? Rational. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then we had Chinese as most rational, uh, and then Greek as the non-rational. Chinese is the most rational. Mm -hmm. And Hebrew is the most non-rational? No, Greek. No, Greek. Greek. Oh, sorry. And then, uh, for human nature, we had the Chinese as most innocent, and Hebrew as most guilty. Okay, Sydney, you really have to you really have to keep that voice projecting, like from the beginning to the end of your contribution, because by the end you were like underwater. Chris Jackson. So and you can just say, you know, and the ones you agree, just say, we agree with this one, whatever. Uh, first one. Speak up, please, Chris. First one, we agree with the China, then Hebrew, then Greek. Okay. For optimistic, pessimistic, we... Uh, Speak have, up, Chris. We have China for most optimistic, and then Greek for middle, and uh, Hebrews for... Okay. Middle. Rational, non-rational? Um, Greek then China, then Hebrews. Okay. And then um, Chinese, um, Hebrew, and Greek. Okay. Finally, Sarah and Case. Um, I oh, no, I left you guys out. Okay, so... Following the spectrum, just um, okay. left to right? Uh, Chinese, Greek, Greek. Um, uh, we're thinking of Hebrews, Chinese, Greeks. Hmm? 
No, no, he was trying to speak. No, so Russian. Oh, did I do that wrong? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said it was did you say Hebrews were, uh, okay, right, Hebrews. I think you did the same you as yeah, with Alvin. Yeah, you no typed G. Okay, so Hebrew, one more time on thinking. Is that right now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, and finally, the innocent to... Um, so And finally, Mina and Kate, uh, uh, Sarah and Kate. Well, for co cosmology, for cosmology, we thought Chinese were the most natural, and then we thought the Hebrews were actually the most supernatural. Um, for outlook, we put Chinese as the most optimistic. Hmm? Is that that G is not supposed to be there? It's supposed to be a C, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because. Okay, and? And we put the Greeks for the pessimistic. Okay. Um, did I just add an extra C for um, Yes, you yes. did. Okay, <laughs> because I thought I deleted <laughs> the last one and changed it to the C it was supposed to be and then forgot to add the other. Right, but, yeah, blah, blah, blah. All right, so, and uh, then we need to have a... Then you're missing, I uh, think you're missing G or H and... H. You said Chinese, Hebrew, Greek for... Optimist specimen? Chinese, yeah. Chinese, Hebrew, Greek. So that's mm -hmm. correct. All right, fine. Um, Next for fine. thinking, we put Greeks, Chinese, and then Jude, for Hebrews. Okay, and then? And then for human nature, we put Chinese, Greek, and then Hebrews. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any other comparative factors that did jump out at you and it's like, you know, when you're annotating, reading, thinking, whatever? Well, in the Greek and Hebrew myth, uh, myths, uh, the humans are created like in similar ways in that they, God and Zeus both take that, you know, earth and mold them into humans. And Nuwa, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, okay. Your homework tonight is to, or over the weekend, is to write about, of all the things covered today, the most interesting thing that I want to actually, because you will be, again, remember, you will be given reading time. So the most interesting thing that I actually want to read more on is, because I found that interesting and I want to start drawing conclusions when I compare across cultures. I'm going to right now quickly give my argument as quickly as possible. And I'm going to tell you, first off, you want to win an A-plus from me? Challenge me with reasoning and evidence. Don't tell me you disagree and I'm wrong and I shouldn't be mean or I shouldn't whatever, right? I shouldn't think. Don't do that. But say, your reasoning's bad, Mr. Bro. As if you're a research assistant and you're like, your claims are bad and if you publish that idea, people are going to pan your book. So... You're awarded for challenging and qualifying. This is my position after thinking about these questions for five years, twice a year. All right. So I've thought about these questions every six months, and I return to them, and this is where I am. So don't bow to my judgments. Challenge, qualify. All right. And I simply put this. I think throwing the Greek stem made it uh, more interesting. Oh, no, I don't want that. Hell and damnation. Oh. Oh, well, I can do that. It's, a, it's this freshman that I had who's hilarious. He did this little webcam thing and it cracked me up. So I, uh, I made it my, my desktop so I could show the freshmen and make them laugh because they're terrified of being in high school. All right. Yes, I think that the Chinese are radically natural. Those of you who think that, that the Chinese were not natural, here's my, here's my reasoning. They make no explanation for how this egg got here. It just got here. It just came much like the Greeks. There was just night and chaos. They don't explain how nature got here. Raise your hand if you can give me any evidence as to how nature got here. The Big Bang is getting closer and closer to being an evidence-based explanation. 
it's really, really getting close. Apparently, there was a major, major announcement that it's like almost gone from theory to like demonstrably true with all sorts of converging areas of evidence. This was like major news three, four months ago. When that happens, that's going to be very interesting. It's going to be like finding fossils and what that does to people who say, uh, fossils, right? Right? So, um, in the meantime, the Chinese don't explain how the egg got here. The Greeks don't explain how chaos and night got here. The Christians, depending on how you read it, not the Christians, the Jews, and the Christians who follow them and the Muslims who follow them and, and every monotheistic Abraham religion who, who is based on this, if they are literal-minded, and many of them are not, I hope you realize that if you're a religious person, there are many ways to read the same sentence. It does not have to be literal. I have some very interesting friends who are Greek Orthodox. They are the most like metaphoric thinking Christians in the world. They're amazing. They, don't, they, they think things that would blow mainstream American Christians away. You don't have to believe in God to go to heaven. You don't have to be saved to go to heaven. This is what Greek Orthodox Christians believe. Um, but in any case, the Hebrews say, if you're literal, yeah, God created it. Bam. That is so unnatural, that's supernatural, right? And then how did he create every other single thing? He said a sentence. That makes no sense to me. That makes no sense to anybody. You say something and it happens, right? As an explanation, that is miraculous by definition. What is a miracle? It's something that cannot be explained rationally. So, this is by definition a miracle-based, and thus you have to have faith in it. This is descriptive. If you, are, if, if you don't realize, as an Abrahamic faith-based religious person, that your entire belief system is based on not reason but faith, you have no idea about the very things that Martin Luther was talking about, right? Faith versus reason. That's the struggle of being a faith-based religion person. i got to have faith. I struggle with it because reason says a lot of it just is really miraculous and doesn't make a lot of sense. So I gotta have faith. That's the struggle of being an Abrahamic person. Um, why do I say the Chinese are radically natural? Because when that when that egg, how did the sky like rise above the earth? Because this thing inside of it kept growing and growing, and that's a very natural thing to do. And as this thing grew, it pushed that thing higher and higher. So that makes sense to me. I can you know you put a kitten inside of a box and you let that box stay there for two years and it's a cat. Well, that box is going to start stretching the more the kitten does grows into a cat. Makes sense. That's very rational for primitive prehistoric storytelling. Um, I, I think it's obvious. Flood happened, fix it. <coughs> flood happened. Major flood. Lots of people are dying. There's misery, all sorts of stuff. What did we do wrong? Nothing. It rained too much. Now let's go fix it. Right? We're innocent. No gods are angry at us. We didn't do anything wrong. Sometimes it just rains too much and you got to work and try to fix it. That's life, right? And so radically optimistic, too. Now, perfect claims? No. But to me, pretty persuasive compared to, obviously, right, the fall in the Garden of Eden, guilt, fallen man. We capitalize the word fallen in Judeo-Christian thinking. The fall, capital F, right? Uh, as opposed to radically rational, I call it doctrinal because a doctrine is something that you're told to believe, although it's not provable. That's a doctrine, the doctrine of original sin. Well, prove it. Well, I can't, but that's what we believe, and you believe it too if you're one of us, right? So the Nicene Creed in church is a doctrine, right? When I was saved and baptized, I was told, you know, on your knees and say, I accept Jesus Christ as my, as my Savior and accept him in my heart, and I believe that he died for, you know, to save me from my sins. That's the doctrine. I was told to say that. Right? That's what we believe. And I became a Christian. So, um, and radically pessimistic. Because, boy, we're sinful. We can't even make our own clothes. God has to make them for us. Right? Um, whereas, meanwhile, China's Noah is out there, like, actually fixing a river that's broken. For ten years, he works at it. And so, done. Now, how do the Hebrews fit into that? interesting for me. It's the first time I've included them in this because now we're east-west. They're awfully violent. I almost want to add a new one, like aggressive, because 
this innocent versus guilty, the Hebrews don't strike me as particularly psychotic, but the Greeks do. Hey, Dad, let me castrate you. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know? Oh, and there's a woman born in that, so that's not natural. I mean, just, just on and on and on. It's like every generation overthrows and kills the parents of its life. Hello, wife, let me impregnate you and then keep you from giving birth while you scream in pain because you've got 12 offspring inside of you that I don't want you to give birth to because they might overthrow me and I'm power hungry, right? I'm the night sky, I'm Uranus, or heaven, as we call it in your translation. Um, so I want to add another one, radically violent, because the Greeks were all about violence, every one of those myths, crazy, right? Those are my claims. I didn't see a lot of violence in the Chinese. Was there any? No, not really. Was there anything negative at all in Pangu? He died. Well, everything dies. That's radically natural. God died. One last thing. None of you are taking notes. This is interesting stuff. Um, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, it depends on whether you're a Hebrew, a Greek, or a Chinese. If you're a Hebrew, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken. The chicken, because, Marissa? <laughs> what are my metaphoric parallels? Chicken, egg, nature, God. Which came first, God or nature? God. Well, in which, in which tradition? Hebrew. Hebrew. No, which came first in the Greek? What made, what made earth? What made the sun? What made the moon? Night and chaos. And it was just born out of them. The gods of Olympus and the Titans and all those other like human-like gods, the god of thunder, the god of this, that, and the other thing, right? All of those gods, they were born from earth. Nature made gods. The egg came first in the Greeks. In the Chinese, literally... Egg. The egg came first, and out of it popped Pangu, the god. So, please take this elementary, but deeply interesting. So interesting that in a naturalistic worldview, in which nature is primary and gods are secondary, nature came first and gods come out of it. Gods are natural creatures, and they die. China is the most radically natural there. Their god died like every other natural thing does. Everything dies. And that's an accepted and natural part of the cycle of life and, and death. What is given life dies at the end. We can all agree on that. We can't agree on doctrinal opinions about what happens after death, but we can agree we all die in this organic form, including gods. China is radically natural. Pangu dies. The Greeks are not. They're less natural because the, the gods live forever. They're immortal, but they're still natural. They live on a mountain. There's no place outside of nature, like capital H heaven, where eternity happens, whatever that is, and all this sort of stuff, right? And there's no bodies, and it's just like completely separate because that's where God was before he said, let there be nature, right? So, radically natural China, there is nothing outside of nature. There is no supernature. Radically supernatural Hebrew. Super means above or outside of. The divine is outside of nature in the Abrahamic religions. The Greeks are closer to the Chinese. Nature created gods. Chinese, nature creates gods, they die. Greeks, nature creates gods, they live forever, everything else dies. Hebrews, God created nature and God never dies and everything else does. Right? Except for God. So... As we go through here, as we go through this course, I'm going to make the claim that from the very beginning we see a China that is peaceful, that is innocent, that does not feel guilt as it walks through the world, that is very, very rational about stuff, not particularly superstitious, doesn't have a lot of doctrinal like, oh, we have faith that this is true. You read my introduction. The Chinese do not believe Pangu did anything. It's a folk tale. Picture a granny telling it to her grandkid on her knee and, you know, chuckling. So we've got extreme east and west on one continent. We've got extremely different mental worldviews on one continent. They can't get any more polar and extreme. They are radical both. China's radically natural. The west is 
radically supernatural. At the seed, at the root. And my argument is, I gave you evidence. It's all in there. So this is an evidence-based argument. Now, I would love to read your criticisms of the argument on your forum posts. I'd love to read them, because I am not God. I'm human, and sharpen me. Show me what I'm missing. Now, moving right along. Now we are going into the Sham. We have until 11.20. Note-taking. I will be collecting your journals occasionally, and I will be looking at them. And I will say, keep your size of immature exasperation dimple to yourself, please. Thank you. All right? I love you to death, but I don't love that. If you were up here giving a presentation, and I sat back there and went, <sighs> you would say, what's his problem? All right, so please don't do that ever again. Okay, do you understand that? Yeah. Thank you. All right. You, you absolutely have the choice to not take notes and accept the grade. It's fine. So, okay? We're starting with the archaic period. Now, here is why I'm having you take notes, because I'm going to go fairly fast. I'm going to give you fairly clear headings and transitions. And you're going to see if you can keep up. Listen to me. What do you do when you get lost? I hope you get lost. What are you supposed to do when you get lost in your notes? Keep moving on. Keep moving on. Leave a couple of lines where you got lost and put a question mark next to it. And keep moving on. Don't stop. Turn to the other person because your professor is continuing talking. You're just going to get further behind if you try to figure out those 30 seconds you missed. Just leave a blank spot, put a question mark there, and come up at the end of the class and say, what was that part? Because you've marked it with a question mark and a blank spot. Am I clear? This is a skill. This is a skill. Otherwise, you get left behind, right? And your notes suck. So, we're starting with China. It's the archaic period, the Shang Dynasty. Now, as you read in your packet, and I don't have notes here, so you, we're starting here. Shang, look at China proper. It becomes the Joe next. I will give you a little song so that you have the entire Chinese history and Shang Joe Wing States, Chin, Shang Joe Wing States, Chin. Han Pio Di Sui Tong. Han Pio Di Sui Tong. Song you and Ming Ching. Song you and Ming Ching. <laughs> ROC, Republic of China, PRC. Right? And, that's, and that starts with the Shang and goes all the way up to this year. Right? And you know them in order. All right? So you know China's unbroken continuous history in one song. And when you know what happened in each one of those, you're like, damn, I'm fairly expert to be like a minor, not even an adult yet. I could blow adults away just by like saying, yeah, the tongue was really interesting when Buddhism came into it, you know, after the period of disunity um, and before the song, when Confucianism like eclipsed uh, Buddhism and remain, you know. Yeah. And adults are like, what? Uh, so Shang and Joe is archaic. That's what we're doing. Let's talk prehistory. Notice, I just gave you Shang and Zhou, that's our major heading. Now let's talk prehistory. That's our first major idea. And the concept I want to start with, keyword concept, so you should have a system at this point, I've told you, a star or something for your concepts. Cultural heroes. Culture heroes. Sorry, culture heroes. It's a general concept. Greece has its cultural heroes. The Hebrews have their culture heroes. These are sort of legendary heroes who go back to the distant prehistoric past, and China's are these. Who is the Greeks? Well, I wouldn't call Adam a hero, but Adam is the earliest named individual in the Hebrew tradition. Who's the first human being who has a name? Adam and Eve. Well, the Chinese have their earliest named people, the first unique individuals in their history. Very interesting to compare them. The first person who is honored with memory in China's name is Fuxi, F-U-X-I. F-U-X-I. Why? Because he is said to have, and he was in your readings very briefly, he is said to have invented the family as a unit and domesticated animals. Invented family, domesticated animals. The second person after him and by the way, Fuxi's wife, you know who she was? Nuwa. 
the woman who made humans out of mud and, uh, and all that. So Pushkin is Waikui Wa. Next culture hero is Shen, or Shen, S-H-E-N, Nong, one word, S-H-E-N-N-O-N-G, Shen Nong, and I don't know the tones, Pushi, Shen Nong, and Huangdi. Um, Shen Nong is credited with, start looking for patterns, it's interesting, I'm not spoon feeding it to you, you tell me, those of you who don't be spoilers who've had this before. The first guy invents, uh, domesticates animals and creates the family unit. The next guy invents something else that's really, really, that earns him, we're going to remember your name forever. Hey, you, in, you, you domesticated animal, that's cool, you can like walk around with pigs now and not chase them. You deserve to be remembered. Also, you like, you like organized us into family groups so that we're not just a bunch of random individuals walking around in this Hobbesian world, nasty, brutish, and short. You deserve to be remembered for those two reasons. The next guy, Shinnok, he invented the plow and the calendar. This is deep. I love this. This is China's earliest memory. And it's not really earliest. We'll get into that when we hit the Han Dynasty. But it's a 2,000-year-old claim. First, we domesticated animals. Then we invented a plow and a calendar. And then the last guy, his name was Huang Di, the Yellow Lord. And the Yellow Lord, Huang River, Huang He, Yellow River, Huang River. The Yellow Lord invented cities and writing and medicine and carts and roads and armies and everything. Okay? Carts. Just, just, just in other words, civilization. Government, roads, transportation, weapons, armies, writing, medicine, everything. Right? So he's like the great culture hero. Now, I will, I will only tell you, first of all, what do we notice about their culture heroes, Adam and Eve? Oh, they're so impressive. They're so impressive. God gives them one simple, you know, limit, and they immediately go after talking to a snake and break it. You know, perfect. I'm in Eden. It's so easy. It's, it's like constant perfect temperature. We're walking around naked. We're not ashamed of it or embarrassed of it. We just don't have to eat from a couple of trees. It's fine. Not particularly impressive people. These guys, all impressive, radically optimistic, radically capable people, right? They do good things, and they make life better for us, and they don't ask God for it. Radically natural, radically optimistic, right? Mm -hmm. And they also, and this is what blows me away. Can you make the pattern? Has anybody seen it? Animals, plows, cities. That's the progression of time that we only figured out, we Westerners, when we got into the modern archaeological age in the past 200 years. Paleolithic, Neolithic, urban revolution. Hunter-gatherers to farmers to cities. China's distant, earliest culture hero memories actually are folk memories, it seems, of their true history. We went from hunter-gatherers to pastoral nomads with animals that we walked around, pigs, goats, sheep, and then we settled down into farming villages, the plow. Great, we've domesticated animals, now we've got a plow, we can farm, and then finally, after a few thousand years, the way it really did happen, cities. Fuxi, Shenong, Huangdi. Notice Fuxi also, families. Please put 10 billion stars next to the term families, or family singular. Because the first person who deserves a name in China invented family. This is staggeringly beautiful to me. I will move on. The next traditional history, culture heroes, are called the Three Sage Kings. You will read the actual primary sources about them very soon. The first one's name is Yao. Chris, put a just leave a blank space and put a question mark and move on. The first sage king is Yao, Y-A-O. The second sage king is Shun, S-H-U-N. The third sage king is Yu, the great, Gai Yu. 
Why you? You read about him fighting the flood. Yao, Shun, and Yu. You will know that name, hopefully in order, because they passed the baton of greatness, one to the next. They knew each other. And they're the three great legendary sage kings. Sage kings is a hugely important term. The word sage, for those of you who don't know it, because sadly in our culture it's not a particularly common word. We don't really value wisdom. Notice there's not a, like, um, freshman wisdom class. Notice there's not a philosophy class at SAS. Look at our educational system. Do we value wisdom? Do we value wisdom? Do we value ethics? Do we value like asking what's good as opposed to what's like convenient, easy, or fun? Or money making? It's a very interesting thing that we don't have a philosophy course in this school. Wisdom is not part of our, we don't use the word sage. We would laugh at somebody using the cafeteria. Moving on. Yao Shun and Yu. We will come back to them later, but they were simply kings who the Chinese remember as great kings, sage kings. An observation to make there, China's memory has now gone from culture heroes who invented things technologically to improve the collective quality of life. Thank you for making a wheel. That's nice. Thank you for making a family. That's nice. Thank you for agriculture, calendars, so we know when to plant. Thank you for doing something publicly beneficial to all of us. Thank you for being a good king, Yao. Thank you for being a good king, Shun. Thank you for being a good king, Yu. We've gone from establishing civilization to now ruling it well. So look at the political. We've gone family and political. Have you noticed a god in any of these earliest named individuals? No. Look at this radically natural, optimistic, and what were the other things? Rational. 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 How rational is that Fuxi, Shenong, and Huangdi thing? I'm sorry, but that's just like Paleolithic, Neolithic, Urban Revolution. I mean, how rational is that? Science actually proved that right 2,000 years later. Um, now, and you fought the flood, and you is said, why you? And I'm not going to pronounce it with the Chinese you sound because I can't do it, and it makes me feel silly. I can't do it. He fought the flood, and then he established the Xia dynasty. Put Xia, the first legendary dynasty, in quotation marks. XIA, sorry, XIA. That was for you. Yeah, you was the founder and first emperor, or king, we'll call him emperor, doesn't matter, of the Xia dynasty. Now, the Xia dynasty is just a legend right now. Traditional Chinese types believe that it happened, but historians don't agree with them. Traditional Hebrews, Christians, depending on which ones, some Hebrews don't, others do, depending on how they believe, believe that Abraham really did exist, although others say, I don't believe that. That's traditional history, but I don't believe that. Why do you think some people say the Shah dynasty does not exist, although Chinese traditional history says it does? Discuss 20 seconds amongst yourselves. It's not a hard question. Because um, I don't know if the Shia dynasty kind of existed. Because after a long time, after like a few years, like decades ago, they, they also thought that the, they didn't know that the Shia dynasty actually existed, so that's what they were saying. Maybe the Chinese civilization started with the Shia dynasty, but later on it was proved that the Shia dynasty was actually the Shia dynasty that they were starting. I think that's the reason why the Shia dynasty was started. Yes, no more. Because so far, everything has been true. So, Jesus How's it to you? Students just brought this up. Chris, could that you, what? Could the you, the you sound about it? The tone. Yeah, it's like, you. Chris has got it. No, it's not. What do you think you know that? Look, the Chinese have a rule. Whenever a foreigner pronounces that morphine, you just go, not quite. 
Okay. Because I like spent an hour in Guilin yeah. while I was studying Chinese a couple of summers. I spent like an hour like just going eat. And she's like, no. And I was like, okay, you, right? Just an hour. And she's like, no, not quite. And I was like, I, 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 I'm never going to make this sound again. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. I quit. When I become the new emperor, Chairman Clay, Mao Zedong simplified Chinese script. He said, it's too damn difficult. There's too many strokes. I'm going to simplify it. I'm going to make the next major one, and I did, by the way, succeed him. You saw it at the assembly last year. My <laughs> picture, painting, portrait replaced Chairman Mao on the, on the, on the Forbidden Cities. Right? I'm now hanging over the gate. I've got evidence. There's a picture. It was shown at the assembly for all of you who were there last year at the opening assembly, last year. Um, Chairman Barreau. And my first declaration was, we're now simplifying the tones and the pronunciation. No more yi and no more tones. I have spoken. <laughs> now, where are my notes so I can keep singing? <laughs> We're at the Shah Dynasty now. Why? What's up with the Shah? Why, do, why is there disagreement? Uh, I want to hear from somebody else. No evidence. No evidence. There's one piece of evidence. What is it? What type of evidence do we have? Oral tradition. Huh? Oral tradition. Oral and textual old, old, old books that the Chinese were very important. So we've got textual evidence making claims. Old books. I'm, yeah, old books. Saying, oh yeah, the Shao Dynasty existed and you existed and all sorts of stuff. But they were written hundreds, even a thousand years later. Okay? So, if, if books written 600, if I like showed you a book that was written this year and, and it says, yeah, there was this guy named Bob who lived in Paris 600 years ago and he said this thing and he did that on you know and, and you would like go do you have any other proof of this no but it's right here in this book well it was 600 years ago how do you know what the hell Bob did anything 600 years ago right a single book is not enough we need more such as what a second book that says yeah Bob lived also hundreds of years after Bob's said to have lived, would that convince you? No, because somebody could have read the first book, right? Or all sorts of people could be talking about Bob. Now, so what, what could persuade us? Uh, primary and secondary accounts. The primary accounts are the books that say Bob. Well, the primary account for the Shah Dynasty is again written 600 years after it was said to have existed. That's our primary source. That's the, the closest we get. Archaeology. And okay, Lauren, you're right. You're right. If we find some primary documents too that are closer to the time, from the time, that sort of thing. So moving on. Right now we have not found it. And that's why right now it's just a legend. Please write that down under Shah. Just a legend. And put it in quotes because I'm playing with you and I'm about to deliver the punchline soon. Um, you found it at 600, and, and it was said to have like started around said to have around 2200 BCE. 2200 BCE, Shah Dynasty is said to have, in traditional history, started 2200 BCE. And it's said to have stopped in 1600 BCE. When Yu's great, 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 grandson of this dynasty, the term dynasty means father to son rule, father or, or Male generation to male generation within the same family, the same bloodline. That's what dynasty means. It stays in the family. So, 600 years later, this Yu family guy is a complete loser named Jie. J-I-E. Jie. The last bad king. That's why this story is important. Because it starts with a great man, and it ends with a really, really bad descendant. A loser. Who is such a loser that the people just go, he's such a loser, he does not, we need to find a different family to rule us. We need revolution. So, the story goes, because there's no, other than books written hundreds of years later, there's no evidence that any of this is true, but it might be. Because after all, it could have been passed down orally from generation. It would be kind of weird for stories to just pop up for no reason. Not impossible, though. Hoaxes pop up all the time. Um, it's a 600 year old dynasty you fixed the flood you as a hero 
We honor him. He's one of our culture heroes. To overthrow his descendant is not a particularly pleasant thing to think about because we honor him as one of our great cultural heroes. So, how would anybody who like said, I'm going to overthrow this jerk Jeb because he's making everybody miserable. He's a horrible, selfish, drunkard, whoremongering, on and on and on, horrible person. The taxes are high so that he can party. Right? He's waging a lot of war so he can plunder, killing our people so that he can party. How do we how do we kill him? The story is that his chief minister, minister meaning government official, top minister, finally lost faith in this Yu dynasty, last bad king Jeff, to redeem himself and ever learn how to be a good ruler. And so his chief minister, called his vice president, whatever, went to a man who was known to be good and said, I hate to be disloyal, but I must, because this man is a monster. And so I will support you, Tong, good man Tong, T-A-N-G, to overthrow the Shao and start the Shang Dynasty. So Tong is the founder of the Shang Dynasty, new section, Shang Dynasty. The Shang Dynasty is also called the Yin, Y-I-N. You will see it referred to as yin or shang, and it's confusing if you don't realize. It's like America versus USA kind of. Right? Um, we still don't have evidence that any of this is true. The Shang Dynasty, for a very long time, was still considered just a legend. All right. So the traditional history went. Notice I keep saying traditional history because there's traditional history and then there is modern history that says we found archaeological stuff and it's true. Traditional history doesn't have the evidence. The, the, much of the Old Testament is traditional history because it's making claims in the, in the Old Testament about things that happened a thousand years before writing was invented by the Hebrews. Right? So they're making claims a thousand years back. We need more evidence. We need to dig something up, whatever. Tom was before China was writing. 1600 BC. Notice, why is he legitimate as a founder of a new dynasty? Because the vice president, the top official of the one that rebelled, actually blessed him. He was like, I, a representative of the Tong, I actually support you in saying you should rule. If he had just come up and said, I want to rule without an official saying, I agree you should, he would not have legitimacy. This is important. I'm giving you a pattern. Tong is the first name of the Shang Dynasty. Later texts talk about, I'm sorry, texts talk about later kings. I'm going to give you two more names from the Shang Dynasty. The year 1250 or so, there was said to have lived a king Wu Ding, W-U-D-I-N-G. King Wu Ding, W-U-D-I-N-G. And his wife, queen or lady Fu Hao, F-U-H-A-O. Wu Ding and Fu Hao. They are very, very, very major legendary kings and queens of the Shang Dynasty. Books written hundreds of years later talk about them a lot. But still, modern historians are like, oh, it's just like Robin Hood. No, it's just like King Arthur, right? Just these sorts of legends. There's no evidence. It's a legend. All right. Until. Oh. Finally, history does start, and we do have evidence of the last Shang king. So here's my favorite last bad king story. Take notes on this one because it's fun. His name is Zhou, unfortunately, because he's overthrown by the Zhou dynasty, who was our classical dynasty, our, our archaic dynasty. The Zhou dynasty, Z-H-O-U, Z-H-O-U. But no, this guy's name is Zhou, Zhou Xin, Z-H-O-U-X-I-N. The last bad Shang king, Zhou Xin, X-I-N. And his wife, the infamous Daji, D-A-J-I. The story goes in 1120. The story goes that he was such a drunkard, such a brute, such a swag YOLO party dude, such a zook every night, screw the world, it's dad's money, I don't care. I've got a trust fund. 
that he used the people's taxes to build a lake and labor. Hey, peasants, come on, give me your taxes so I can buy the materials and come. You're going to work by forced labor to build a lake and fill it not with water but with wine. You are going to build islands in the middle of that lake and plant trees on them. On those trees daily, you're going to slaughter your cattle, roast it, and put shish kebabs hanging from the trees. I am going to have a wine lake with meat trees. And me and my homies are going to paddle our boats across. No, your, your peasant asses will paddle it for us. You will paddle as we sit in these boats, drinking wine from the lake as we float across it, coming up to that island where we then, like, I'm hungry, I think I'll have some beef or some pig and eating it from the meat tree, and then desert your daughters underneath those trees, because I'm the king, and it's nice to be the king. We want your daughters as just our pleasure toys. And so, the people hated his guts. And we'll stop our story there. He doesn't sound very rational. Well, you know, he's a typical rich kid. <laughs> okay. Um.